What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over projectiles. So projectiles are particularly important right around now because we're going to be getting into combo states pretty soon. And with this adjustment, with how we're handling combos and hit reactions and all these different things that are going to be coming now that we have our system set up to work with some frames instead of uh, times, we want to make sure our game flows well. Like right now, we have a lot of good mechanics, and I think they feel pretty good. But there are some things that don't feel great. For example, following up this attack in any way, sure, it feels good. However, in an actual combat setting, say we both attack each other, we can hit each other and then take uh, a hit reaction afterward. And that doesn't feel too great. And this, this all comes down to the new system that we're going to be working on. I'm calling it like combo states and hit reaction states and all this but really it's just combat flow we have to prioritize moves we have to determine what happens when you're hit what we actually want to occur we need to start setting up our startup active and recovery frames for attacks and different things like that so we have a ton of work ahead of us still and before we get into that i want to make sure that our projectiles and our other components of our combat feel good because they're a little bit lacking in certain places so we're going to clear up all that today that way we can make our projectiles work as intended so uh, specifically today we're going to give our projectiles lifetimes that way they are destroyed whether they are uh, manually in the game or not just by uh, being alive for a certain amount of time this is good for both memory management and also for we could use it for balancing if we only want things to be alive for so long before they disappear, different things like that. KO. Another thing we are going to be going over is uh, handling Fight. hitbox collisions on these things and how we can adjust them to make them a little bit better. So right now, they're just there's basically a hitbox that attaches to a projectile, and if it hit the opponent, it was dealing damage. And that's fine, but we had no way to actually block it. I don't know if you noticed, because it did not have a proximity hitbox. So if you wanted to block it... Blocking would reduce your damage, but you couldn't just back away from a projectile. If you want to be able to do that, we're going to be covering that today. And we're also going to be covering just a lot of different things that we can change to make our projectiles a lot more useful. Such as um, being able to change the location of the hitbox in relationship to the projectile. And changing the projectile's rotation based on what direction is being sent out or what player is using it. So for now, when we have a, a projectile like this fireball, you know, it only seems to come out one way. I've attached this like cylinder to it, and you might be asking yourself why. It's because when I launch it from the other direction, I should be able to rotate the object. So you can see that the objects that we have here, when I launch this one from player one, the cylinder is facing down and to the right. If I launch it from player two, it's facing down and to the left because I rotated the object. When you're not using just a particle system, you have to make sure that you are rotating the object to face the correct direction as well, or it will be ugly. These are little things, but they all kind of group up and, you know, it can determine if the game is going to be enjoyable or if there's going to be a lot of things that are lacking. So we want to fix everything that we can related to these issues starting now. All right. So we're going to go over everything that I just mentioned today. However, if you want to catch up to what we've been doing in the series and how we got to this point, then feel free to click this link in the top right corner to check out the entire fighting game playlist. And then if you just care about projectiles, I'll show you this first episode right here where we initially made these projectiles. Otherwise, let's get started. So, we have quite a few things here, and I have them open already, but I'm going to go through and show you what I've got now. Because our projectile system has changed since the initial setup. So we had something called Default Projectile BP. And this was actually the fireball to start. But we don't want that. Um, we want all of our projectiles to be unique, and we want... I've tried to categorize them, so if we have different ones that are similar to each other, we can just make them a child of a certain class. So instead of having the fireball as the default projectile BP, I've made a, another class. Now I had these two children classes from before, from other episodes, specifically the homing thunderball projectile and the up from ground, um, I did that backwards, the homing thunderball projectile. So it's a projectile that you throw out and then it goes toward the opponent. And then 
Also, the up from ground projectile, which is like a tornado that rises up from the ground at the enemy's location. So I've added this uh, prods from projectile horizontal. And what this is, is I've gone into my default projectile BP, looked at my class settings, made sure my parent class was actor, and then on the particle system, I took off the template. The template is what gives the fireball the fire, if you don't remember. So if we go to our particle system, the template is this fireball. So when I look at it in a viewport, I can see this you know, material effect here uh, with the fire and the particle effect and the particle system. So now default projectile BP is not going to be the fireball anymore. So you can go ahead and remove it, hit the little yellow arrow to reset to the default, or just click on it and clear it. And then I've also added a static mesh component because while the particle systems may be good enough, you may want static meshes as well. You may even want skeletal meshes to animate the projectiles. So set this default projectile BP up how you want. Specifically what I did was add a static mesh component and then click on the static mesh. Of course, I haven't applied anything in the default projectile because this is just the parent class. And I've set it to have no collision and not generate overlap events. We still want to handle all the collision through the hitbox, not the static mesh. The static mesh is just there if you don't have a projectile um, particle system and you want to, you know, display something else. Cool. So the last thing you need to know before you're caught up and we can get started with the fixes in this episode is I've made this projectile horizontal class, as I said. The way I made it is I right-clicked on default projectile BP, create job blueprint class, and then I've called it uh, projectile horizontal. And then I set up my particle system in here for the fireball. And I applied this random pipe mesh just so you could see that it was rotating properly. I will be removing this after the episode, but putting this logic in here to rotate them is good enough. All right. So now today, what we're going to do is we have these events in the default projectile BP, and these are not new events. These already existed except for event tick. Event tick is going to be regarding the lifetime, which is new to today's episode. But we have these other events, spawn projectile and force destroy, and we use them throughout the other projectiles when necessary. So the homing projectile uses spawn projectile. And it looks like this, by the way, if you don't remember. And the up from ground projectile uses force destroy and spawn projectile. And it looks like this. Now, I'm not going to be changing anything specifically with either of these two today, uh, just because the homing projectile and the, the up from ground, they actually are symmetrical. And just like the fireball particle system, I don't need to rotate them in any way. So I'm not going to mess with this right now. I just wanted to show you how you could rotate them. And I want to show you mainly stuff in default projectile BP to create the lifetimes and things like that. But I wanted to show you what these guys look like so you remember. And I wanted to show you that we were using these events. Now, in C++ and a lot of Unreal, when we have this parent-child relationship, like spawn projectile, if we do this in the parent class, the children are going to do this logic, but they're going to do their logic first. Well, if this is just the default projectile BP, which all actor or sorry all projectiles are going to be a child of this default projectile bp and they are then we don't want this spawn projectile to do any logic because this logic already is unique to uh, horizontal projectiles such as the fireball it does not match the homing projectile and does not match the up from ground projectile technically Leaving it in won't really hurt in this case. However, we don't need it. So I'm going to get rid of the logic in the default projectile BP. That logic that I had for the fireball is in the uh, projectile horizontal class now. All right, so my apologies if that was confusing. But what I'm trying to get at is since we're now getting into better combat, I want to make this system as flexible as possible. So I have a default projectile BP and I have these other blueprints that are basically the standardized logic for this type of projectile, this type of special attack, such as up from ground, a homing projectile, or a horizontal projectile. 
there's plenty more that you can make as well. All right, and now that should make quite a bit of sense. Um, you can see this is the entire blueprint. I'm not hiding anything. This is the fireball, okay? Again, it's the same logic that we had in spawn projectile, and the way you find this event, as long as it's a child of your base, your base projectile BP, default projectile BP, whatever you called it, then you can just search for these events and find them, event, spawn, projectile. So I did this, and once the fireball is spawned, it will do this logic. And this is stuff we've, we've been used to, right? But again, we're just not doing it in this parent class anymore because we want the logic to be specific to this type of projectile. This stuff that I've done is actually exactly as you'd expect. All I've done is uh, change the velocity based on the direction. And then I've also gone ahead and added this on the end of it where I've rotated the actor itself. I did rotate the entire actor because right now I only have this mesh on it that gets rotated. If you have multiple parts of your component and you don't want some of them to rotate, then all you have to do is drag off the mesh itself and say set rotation. And you will be able to set it on that specific component. So if you don't want to rotate the entire actor, but rather just a specific part of it, again, such as a mesh, then feel free to do this method. For me, I'm just rotating the entire actor. And the logic I picked is pretty simple. I have this Boolean called is facing left. Um, this was previously is flipped. And I adjusted it a few episodes back. So if the character is facing left, then we apply the velocity times negative one, which again is stuff we did in the first projectile episode. But I don't change the rotation of this object just because it happens to line up with uh, what direction the object should be facing if it's going that direction. Otherwise, we want to flip it 180 degrees on the z-axis, which makes it go the other direction. That way it makes sense for going... Um, you know, having the velocity the exact opposite of what this top one did. If we're facing right and we use a fireball, it should come out to the right. If we're facing left and we use the fireball, it should come out to the left. So this simple set actor rotation will handle that. All right, and at that point, you're caught up on all the projectile types and everything that we've done to the specific projectiles, if you care about that. Now we're going to get into the things that we're adding for all projectiles and how we're going to clean up some of our logic to make it uh, work better for the future things that we are adding. All right, so first things first, I'm going to add a lifetime in the default projectile BP. I think all projectiles or all special moves that spawn anything should have a lifetime because even if it's a, a some sort of actor that is going to, no matter what, disappear after a certain amount of time. If you don't actually destroy it, then it's going to keep taking up memory. It's going to keep ticking unless you turn these things off. So really what we should do is wait until time runs out um, on its life. You know, we give it a, a specified lifetime and then destroy this object. You can do it in seconds or you could do it in tick, uh, in frames. So in the tornado, we ended up using a timeline, and basically once the timeline was complete, we had called we called this event force destroy. Um, minor adjustment that I made. It didn't matter for our case, but I did in this force destroy event. I had these two connected. That was very bad. Make sure that you're you destroy the actors for each component, and then on completion of this for loop, you destroy the overall actor. Anyway, though, um, so we were using time here. Once the timeline was complete, we were calling force destroy and cleaning up the actors. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if you want to use frames, because we're switching a lot of our systems over to frames, such as our stun, our input buffer, all these other things, then we can also do that. And so that's what I've done here. Since this is the default projectile BP, when we make a variable in it, all the children of this are going to get access to that variable. So we can manually set the lifetime. So make a new variable. I made it an integer and called it lifetime. I gave it a default value of 500. If you compile and save, you'll get access to this, this default. You don't have to give it a default value if you don't want. Just make sure that each projectile has a value assigned to it. The way you get to this is you go into your children classes. This is the fireball. 
click class defaults, and then look at the lifetime. I put it to 500 because I think 500 is good. If we're assuming our game runs at 60 seconds and we're doing this based off of frames, then this is a little, this is right around eight seconds. All right. And then just to show you, I made these other ones different. So the homing projectile is 420 ticks or frames. And the tornado is 1,000 frames. It should be destroyed anyway by this force destroy event, but it doesn't hurt to use the lifetime anyway. If the actor gets destroyed, then it will never perform this logic that we set up here. So really, it's just a bonus to, to leave it on. So anyway, we'll go through this logic together. In the default projectile BP, make sure you add event tick if you aren't using it for something already. Once you've made your lifetime variable, you can drag it onto the screen to get it. This next node you see is a decrement integer, decrement int. And what that means is it will just take away one every time. Subtract one from the specified value, then set it. So lifetime starts at 500. When it goes to this node, it subtracts one, which makes it 499. And then this is the return value, which is 499. So we want to make sure that this is greater than zero still. If it's greater than zero, then its life is not over. And you can then, you know, continue your logic. However, if this turns out to be false, if this turns out to be false that it is not greater than zero, which means it is equal or less than zero, its lifetime has completed. We've already done, event tick runs every frame. So we've already done 500 frames where this was alive and thus, its lifetime is done. So the logic afterward is pretty simple. I get attached actors because we want to make sure that we don't leave anything alive that needs to go down with it. We end up attaching the hitbox to it um, as we did in the other episodes for projectiles. And so we want to get our attached actors. Reset array is fine. We want to loop through them. You can do it with or without break. I don't use the break here. And then we want to destroy all the attached actors. That way we know all the attached actors are cleaned up properly. And we're managing our memory well. And then on completion, we want to destroy this actor. You see that? So we destroy all the ones out of this array. And then we destroy this actor, which is the default projectile BP. Now I'm going to clean this up because you can see it all up above. And that's event tick. Now we don't have to override this in any of the other projectile classes unless you had different plans for it. If you do, by all means, go ahead. Otherwise, I'm just leaving this alone, setting the lifetime variable for the specific projectile, and that's all I'm doing. There is another thing you could do as well. And you could actually click on the default projectile BP, the top part here. Scroll down in the details panel. And then you could say uh, initial lifespan and set it a value. This is in seconds, not frames. So it is a little bit different from this. But the other thing is this will automatically destroy this object once that time is reached. In event tick, I figured we might want to play a particle effect or something like that when we destroy just in case, just to be safe. So if the player happens to see it, you know, maybe if the projectile is on the screen, we want it to blow up as opposed to just disappearing because it can be um, a little bit less exciting if it just disappears phases out of existence. I haven't done anything like that today, but we'll get into that stuff when we get into more VFX. And at this point, you don't really have to do anything else. So next up, we are going to go to our hitbox actor BP. Now hitbox actor BP, we had logic where if the hitbox display overlapped an opponent and the hitbox type was projectile, then we would deal damage. And that was working well. We did add this, this um, interesting concept called complex hurt boxes, which we're not currently using. It was a requested video that I'll link right here where we had more specific hurt boxes than just the regular square. And so because of that, we made some other logic where if it fails to cast to a hurt box actor BP, we can still de deal damage if it collides with one of these objects. So I've changed the logic a bit up top, and I've also changed it on the bottom. 
So we'll go through this whole function again. But everything here, everything after this is valid is the same as it was. I have not adjusted it at all, but I have made a few changes beforehand. So we're going to cover our on component begin overlap hitbox display and our hitbox actor BP. It's going to be very similar logic, but essentially what we're doing now is we're going to grab the actor that we collided with. The hitbox display of the hitbox is what it sounds like. You can't really see it right now, but we have this cube here and we put a material on it that relates to the hitbox type. So proximity, strike, throw, projectile, that sort of thing. And when that collided with something, we check to see if it's a projectile because we have this check collision function that works for all of our uh, melee and physical attacks. But if it's a projectile and it didn't hit immediately, we need to make sure any time that this hitbox collides with an opponent that we perform the logic. So we were casting to see if it was a hurtbox actor BP. Hurtbox actors are what we attach to our characters at the start. Um, to, you know, it's this green hurt box, it's this green square that we check for collision. We're not just checking against our whole mesh. If we succeed, then we were getting the owner of the hurt box, casting to the proper type, making sure that the owner of the hurt box was not the owner of the projectile, that way we can't hurt ourselves with our own projectile. And then we were calling take damage. You can see I've added a new thing in here called collided with projectile hitbox. We have something similar in the physical attacks called collided with proximity hitbox. The reason I have this logic in here is because we want to be able to automatically block if we're backing away and the block conditions are accurate. So what we're going to do is have this code function called collide with pro uh, projectile hitbox. I'll show you what that looks like. So we go to our fighter template character or our base character class. I had this function in it called collide with proximity hitbox, as I said. And this basically checks your state if you're walking away, not attacking or anything, but simply walking in the um, direction opposite of your opponent when you get hit by a hitbox. Then we want to call, we basically want to set the character state to block. We want to make them automatically block. And so what I've done is copy the logic. In fact, copy it almost exactly. I changed the comment to projectile and the name to collide with projectile hitbox. If we go into the fighter template character CPP and scroll down, you can see I've also copied the CPP function. So you don't necessarily need another function. Right now they are the same and I understand that. But we may want to do different logic down the road with this and we may want to handle this sort of thing differently. So for right now, I've set it up as almost this boilerplate, you know, default if we're facing this direction and moving this way or facing this direction and moving this way we are going the opposite direction of the opponent so we want to make sure our state is now blocking we want to block this attack right now the way blocking works is we actually take a block time that gets uh assigned when we get attacked and we block for that amount of time that's fine um it's it's you know, it makes sense to do it that way when we're working off seconds, but as we get into frames, we're going to have to adjust that as well. So right now, I've kind of just left this the same, just so we had the ability to block projectile hitboxes. If our system for blocking is going to change, it will, of course, adjust this, but we had no way to actually automatically block projectiles, which is not something I wanted to leave out. Okay. So, as I said... You can just copy your other function if you have this. All right. And after uh, this gets set, we say, oh, we're blocking because we collide with this. When we go into take damage next, we do some checks to determine if it's the right hitbox height, if we're in the right character state. And that's why we want to do this before. We don't actually have to make any changes to take damage right now. But it's something important that I thought you guys should see. All right. Um, make sure that you made that function blueprint callable as I had. And that way, when you cast your fighter template character, you can drag off of it and type collided with projectile hitbox. And again, still call take damage afterward. Don't change anything. Just add this in here. 
And since this is meant to be a template that supports everything that we have, I do have the logic as well for the complex hurt boxes if that's what you're going for. Again, we already set up this logic last time, so it's nothing you have to be concerned about there. Now that we're adding more components to our hurt boxes, our characters, and the hitboxes themselves, as well as projectiles even, we want to make sure that our logic continues to work as we add more things. We don't want to introduce more bugs. So with all the new things we've added, um, it would actually cause the projectiles to hit multiple times the way it was set up. And so a good way to solve this for now, if we're not using complex hurt boxes, we will probably have to uh, go back to this as we get f f uh, farther into the future with everything that we're working on. But for now, basically, if we're using the, the simple hurt box, we only ever want to do this logic. So if this cast were to fail for any reason, and it was still going to call take damage on this component, say it collided with the mesh, we want to avoid that altogether. So I've done this very simple thing. On cast failed, um, I've added this. You should have everything after this. But I've added base game mode reference is using complex hurt boxes. And only if that's true do I continue to do this logic. Otherwise, it fails out, and we just don't deal damage to the player. Basically, it didn't collide with their hurt box, so we don't care about it. And then, again, in the complex hurt boxes section, the bottom part here, I've also added collide with projectile hitbox before I've done take damage, so the attack can still be blocked. All right. And a small adjustment, but if you're following the code directly, then this base game, game mode reference was only ever being set in the function determine player, which we use in check collision to determine if it's the owner of this player, if player one or player two. And so because of this, then uh, the base game mode reference would actually be invalid if check collision did not get called, which we don't call it on projectiles. And so it would be invalid and this would give you errors. Simple fix for that is in determine player, take out the logic you have here, which will be get game mode, cast the fighter template game mode, and set base game mode reference. Instead, replace it with this get game mode reference. And just drag it on the screen and get it. And then um, go up in the event graph. I have two now. Get event begin play. And then do the logic here. Get game mode, cast the fighter template game mode, and set base game mode reference. There you go. And this is the hitbox actor BP as expected. All right. The last thing that we want to set up for now is we want to make sure that our uh, projectile hitboxes and special move hitboxes can be spawned where we want them to be. Currently, we have been attaching them to the projectile itself, the projectile actor, but we don't always want that. For example, we could have a one move that has multiple hitboxes. In fact, most moves actually end up having multiple hitboxes in the end. That's something we'll get into more depth later in the series, but we may want a, a projectile to have multiple or a special move to have multiple and we may want them to be in different spots that aren't necessarily directly related to the center of the mesh. And so we had the ability to offset them a bit, but we weren't actually using it. We were mainly using the scale. We weren't actually using the location of the rotation of the transform variable in the AnimBP create projectile hitbox. So how we're going to handle this is like this. This is my spawn fireball event. This is something that has been around for a long time since we started doing projectiles. I'm making sure I'm spawning my projectile horizontal now as opposed to my default projectile BP. So make sure you make that adjustment. But my player transform and the character reference are fine to be the same that they were. And then we have this create projectile hitbox function and then we call spawn projectile. Uh, the other projectiles I have are a little bit different I've made episodes covering each of them, but basically I do different logic for them. However, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they call create projectile hitbox. And we give it different times. You know, make sure you give everything times and the correct values for each attack. But the reason I bring this up 
create projectile hitbox. When we went into it in the past, we weren't actually using the location or the rotation. We were using, we passed in a transform. We passed in a transform so that we could give it a scale, essentially. You can see in the spawn rising projectile, we gave a scale, but we weren't using any of the other variables, even though I had this as 0, 0, and you know, 1, 1, 25. We had the variables there, but they never linked to anything in this function. So now what I've done is I've added a minor thing before we spawn the hitbox. That way we can assign it directly where we want it. So first of all, when we attach to the actor, we can still attach to the spot that we want. We just don't want to um, attach it somewhere where we won't be able to use it. So for example, let's go into this so you can see what I'm talking about. Ready? Okay, Fight. so if I remember my own attack, this is the spawn rising projectile. Now it's way overpowered and it should not be allowed to do that, but we're gonna ignore that for now because it's fun. You can see now before the hitbox was actually just at the ground part of this. And so because it was at the ground, I could actually do almost nothing. Um, it, it had to be very specific to hit the player. And that's because it was spawning at the center of that actor, of that projectile up from ground. We wanna be able to move it. You can see I moved it way higher above the ground now, so it hits anywhere in that area. Maybe you jump over, that's how you dodge it, whatever. You know, that that's more of a game design thing. But we do want to be able to move the hitbox regardless. So to do this, what I've done is, again, everything in here is the same. I've added a hitbox height to the, the create projectile, which we have in the other functions. But just so you can see the whole thing, everything else is the same. So, um, if you click on your create projectile hitbox, go to your input parameters, you can add a new parameter, change it to E hitbox height, call it height, and it'll be here. Make sure you set whatever you want to call them. Uh, for me, I put it to high for the fireball. That way you could standing block. The other ones are actually, I, I consider the one low. I guess I should consider the homing thunderbolt probably also high. That way you can block it while you are standing and just walking backward you can auto block but it doesn't really matter for now that's something that can be configured easily later and then i do my standard stuff that i do for these create hitbox functions where i drag the height all the way over here and i set the hitbox height before we call spawn hitbox as long as you set it anywhere in here you are good all right but what I've added that is good for changing the actual location of the hitbox is this stuff right here. So we were using just the scale before, but we did have the entire transform. Now you can drag off the location and we can use it to move it up, down, left, right, whatever. So I grab the, I drag off the projectile reference and get the actor transform because this is something that we need to know where the hitbox is going to be. We can split the struct pin if we right click and split struct pin to see the individual values. We don't care about the rotation or scale here. They, they can line up with the projectile currently. I can't think of a way uh, of a reason we would need to adjust it in this case, but there's always plenty of times where we may want to uh, increase it separately, depending on what your game has to do. All I do is I actually add the uh, locations together, the location of the projectile and then the location that we give it so if we do plus vector plus vector and pass in the transform location of as the function input parameter once we add these two together i'm going to delete these now once we add these two together we can pass that in and make a new transform so before we were getting actor transform and passing it directly into the spawn transform here now we split this added the location of the projectile to the location that we defined in the NMBP, passed along the rotation and scale, and called this node make transform. And then passed in all the values, just like this. Location, rotation, and scale. Then we take the return value and pass in the spawn transform. One other adjustment with that, we were already attaching the hitbox actor 
uh, once we spawned it to the projectile. But we now want to make sure the location rule is keep world. And we can set the rotation rule and scale rule to snap the target. But we want to keep world because we want to uh, allow the location that we set here in this hitbox to stay valid. Now, if you don't want to move the hitbox manually, it's fine. Just don't set it. Like in the in the fireball, I already have the hitbox where I want it on the projectile. I want it to be right over the projectile. And where it's at, it's fine. I decide I like it. So I just don't pass anything in. If I split the struck pin, everything's zero. So it's adding zero to our values. Thus, it's not changing the position at all. So this is really good because this, this uh, addition here doesn't change it if we don't want to change it. So this just gives you more freedom. If you do need to change it, you can enter numbers and allow it to change. Otherwise, you leave it alone and it works as it always has. Okay, and that's pretty much it. These changes have allowed us to, going over the list one more time, we are able to now spawn into the game. And we can use a projectile, and we can jump over the projectile, or, well, if I was able to actually do it correctly. Right here. You can see that there's this uh, horizontal projectile. It destroys itself. That's because the lifetime reached the value that it needed to, and thus we cleared it up and, and got rid of it. Before, that would stay around forever if it never collided and got destroyed by anything. Alternatively, you can destroy it when it collides with one of the camera boundaries, if you'd like. All right. That's one thing that we've added. We are also able to um, use a projectile and deal damage and when we look at the damage in the output log you can see that we only do damage one time again when we had the complex hurt boxes set up we were able to do damage multiple times on one single attack which is not what we actually want KO. another thing we are able to do is to perform a, an attack or an animation that spawns an object that is oriented the way we want it to. If I spawn a projectile from this direction, remember, the pipe was facing down to the right. If I spawn it from this direction, the pipe is facing down to the left. We actually rotated the actor. The hitbox still works. If I don't jump over, it will still collide with me. and I will still take damage, but it is facing the opposite direction, so it can accurately represent where our players are sending it or where they're using it from. We also allowed us to manually adjust where hitboxes spawn for projectiles. They don't have to be directly attached to the projectile itself anymore. There we go. If we perform this attack, then everything still works as intended. So you can see that our changes we made did not, did not ruin the other projectiles that we had, but instead gave us more functionality, and now we have more freedom to do what we want with it. You can see if we switch, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Just trying to move you over. I got confused because I was looking at the other side. Um, then the projectile works from both sides still. <clears throat> Perfect. And there we go, guys. So this is just a general projectile uh, fix and improvement episode. It's important because a lot of these things we do need for everything to function properly together. In the, the following episodes, and I've mentioned this a few times, I'm preparing this combo system, this hit reaction system, all these all these combat logic things that are important, and I'm compiling them and figuring out the best way I want to handle all of it before I come out with an episode on it. But once we get into that, our combat should feel a lot better. And so at that point, I want to start um, doing things like startup, active, recovery frames, and setting those for each attack so that we can play around with our attacks, different things like that. So anyway, guys, that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If I helped you, please subscribe. It does more for the channel and for me than anything else you can do, and I just really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout-out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for continuing to give me that support and encourage me to take this farther and farther. 
If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community that we have. There's a link in the description. I'd be happy to help you out. And if you want to come hang out with us and play some games, you can come follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash show on the road 27 or subscribe to the show on the road 27 YouTube channel. That's all I got for you today, guys. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.